it's me again and the time travel involved in making this video is kind of crazy because now we've played several sessions and now I'm putting my mind back after editing the preparation and where am I you know, what am I talking about and from what perspective and it sort of matches the comics idiom that we've come up with that it's kind of crisscrossing and, and weird because what I want to talk about is what I saw when the characters that they were just beginning to talk about at that point uh, came through and neither of the players is, was all that familiar with the rules and so I had to kind of say well if that's what you want let's do this for some of the construction but I think I stayed clear you know with what they were aiming at we ended up with uh, the Havsmanen which is Ulf's character who's very much a um, kind of, I don't want to say spongy, but kind of, kind of fishy guy lives out in the archipelago and um, is kind of a rustic fellow. Uh, he lives, you know, Swedish is Sweden's second largest urban center is Yotobori, but the archipelago out there, I mean, you get real, you know, back to the sea, back to the islands kind of lifestyle real fast and um he you know works as a as a uh, taxi boat guy um but anyway he's you know a spawn of the you know the, the ones under the sea and he's sad and lonely and you know his parents are are lost and dead and he um you know is, is kind of a wondering if he can carry on the you know last of the line kind of situation for his heritage and does super heroic stuff like help shipwrecks and stuff like that and um, has a few problems uh, i was cued by ulf to look up some of the interesting events of the baltic and north sea and there's a lot of great stuff to work with um the, well, first of all, one that Ulf didn't mention was the recovery of the Vasa, which dates all the way back to the early 60s and finally became the modern museum uh, in the 1990s. So that's an amazing thing right there. Um, it's, in, you know, it's impossible not to, to think, well, something came up with the Vasa, you know, and they brought it up. And that's in the harbor at Stockholm on the other side of Sweden. Also on the other side of Sweden in the Baltic is a very famous wreck of a ship which at that time was called the Estonia and it has a kind of fascinating history and it's uh, the failure of its floodgates thingies um, is a, a very political and historical important issue uh, for all sorts of things um, so ship safety standards and many other things but uh, it's a huge tragedy it was in 1994 and according to Ulf, his character's parents were lost with the wreck of the Estonia. And I learned all kinds of crazy things. I mean, first of all, it was huge national security issue, just like out of nowhere. They're like, why is this passenger ship suddenly this huge national security issue? And the whole area was locked down. Nobody could go there. And the area is still to this day secured and monitored um, by the Finnish Navy. You, you can't go. There's all these countries all suddenly like colluded to, you know, lock out this wreck from being recovered or investigated or anything. And that's, that's really kind of fascinating right there. It's real spooky. So, um, you know, his parents were involved in that somehow. Who knows? And then there's also an event from 2011 where a whole bunch of military of Swedish military were deployed into the archipelago and there was these very weird news reports that were clearly parroting whatever they were told to say uh was never clear whether there was a mysterious underwater craft uh there was never uh it, it was never quite stated you know why and it's a, a matter of some pop culture or you know political conspiracy you know, blithering about what on earth it was or who it was, and you know, but it was, but it was a big deployment, and you know, is is all kinds of you know, 
speculative. And that's great. I mean, this this is just gold, you know, for for a character like Hobbs Money. So there's all this cool stuff to work with that I got to look up and I got to learn more about the Swedish intelligence agencies too because he's being hunted by one of them in a manipulative way. And that, of course, is, is clearly going to head back into, um, you know, Swedish history and, and spy stuff of which Sweden is amply supplied. So uh, so that's just all kinds of fun. I mean, that's that's... That he's he's got the call of the sea, you know. If he fails an ego roll or you know an awareness check, is weird, you know, regional, you know, through the waters awareness. And if he fails it, then he gets hit with mind control to you know go back, go deep, go deep, you know, go swim back to the sea, find the great dreamer, kind of thing. Um, so he's kind of always hearing this, you know, give it all up, give up the surface, you know, go back to the depths, kind of impulse. Um, but uh, but anyway, so he's you'll notice he, he's kind of depressing. He's kind of a, sits out there on the islands and looks out to sea, and you know he's got a girlfriend uh, who is kind of on and off, and is kind of a towny, you know, towny woman kind of at loose ends with herself and a cryptid fan, and she she found him right, you know, she'd heard about him and came out and he was real and they ended up in this relationship and neither of us knows where it's going or whether it's the right thing to do. And it's just not, of course, what he envisions at all of being like a man of the islands and, you know, thinking about a you know, family heritage, we can raise a kid. That's, you know, that, that doesn't work at all for this. So he's all kinds of messed up um, as well as a, a good hearted fellow. So that's Hobbs Menon, and I've kind of gone a little too far into the details because I was enthusiastic. You'll have to forgive me. Um, what I wanted you to focus on was the inner and outer space aspect of it and the idea that the ocean is a depth. It's not just water on a planet. It's it's depth. There's, you know, you go down into the ocean and you're, you know, open your awareness and your mind will expand into places that aren't just like underwater. So um, the notion of water as a symbol of the unconscious and many other things like that are all tied into here and, you know, secrets and the past and all that stuff. You go down to the water and you like try to find secrets, you know, things that are hidden because they're, you know, underwater. Okay, so that's the uh, the, the sort of groovy or, you know, inner outer space aspect of this. And the Great Dreamer is kind of a Cthulhu reference, although it's not a hunted situation and there's no guarantee or, you know, there's no content there that's particularly sinister. But, you know, there is a Great Dreamer, you know, associated with the ocean and he is, you know, it's it's, it's a little... He is called by the great dreamer and you know stuff like that. It's 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 got kind of a little Cthulhu going on there if you want it to be, and that led me to think about well, are we talking about like the greater evil if we're talking about Cthulhu, and how sick am I of that whole shtick anyway? And the answer is considerably so. So if I'm going to use that kind of content, I'm definitely going to subvert it or alter it into some form that I like better. So that's what I'm thinking about. So we take that same cos concept over to the cosmonaut where it's just so obvious. I mean, yes, you've got this, this cosmonaut spacesuit with CCCP on it and um, this, this very, even more alienated guy. He's a, you know, an getting just a little past his youth school teacher in a rough part of Sweden, a uh, rough part of Yotabori. He's uh, uh, lost and broken and alone. He's had this breakup. He's, um, you know, disconnected from reality even. His mind spins off into weird places. He's a math teacher. Perhaps that's part of it, you know, mathematicians, you know. And he... Um, he has this suit that he's that he the the player you know, Ola tells me that the suit you know wants him. There's sort of a direction or a purpose to the suit that wants him, and so he sort of finds himself drifting in it. Um, and of course, the idea is right. It's a cosmonaut. It's a suit that goes into space, right? Well, yeah, but space, man. 
is it like going out into space or is it going like into you know is it is the travel to other places is that just a matter of like being an airplane or a rocket and just going or is that like knowing and then you're there and whoa so that whole thing and of course that led me to look into the cosmonaut history and one thing that kind of fascinated me is that Everybody seems to go after the notion of 1950s cosmonauts who, you know, either beat America to the moon after all um, and stuff like that. But it's all this earlier stuff. And I was much more interested in the psychedelic side of it and was more interested as well in the Swedish intelligence agency histories of kind of, you know, playing CIA, KGB, you know, buddy back and forth, not buddy with you anymore, but I am sort of tricks, you know, this kind of back and forth thing that, especially with um, a couple of the agencies that are reasonably sinister, you know, as some branches of many of the agencies tend to be. And uh, it seemed very well suited to that the FBI back in the 70s, late 60s and 70s, that the this particular version of it, of this agency, uh, would have been very well suited for swiping things for its own sake. So maybe they swiped the Soviet cosmonaut thing, and maybe the cosmonaut thing wasn't going into space, or they tried to have it go into space, didn't work out so well, but they went somewhere else. So I said, okay, let's, let's play with this conspiracy theory stuff let's never mind the standard stuff about the 1950s let's make up new stuff which is much more about the psycho space you know they're ethernauts really you know psychonauts that's much more you know oh cool you know we're, we're cooking with gas now so um we've got all this mysterious stuff because this he doesn't know what the suit wants and he 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 now he helps you know he uses the suit to find lost people to help those who are beyond help to so he's actually really altruistic um and then he you know sort of through a bunch of internet cutouts and firewalls is able to inform people like either authorities or services or something who are able to help the people that he finds and so um so he's kind of this they're, they're both kind of cryptids i mean or as i pointed out one step pu more public than a cryptid in that people know they exist but where they can be found and whether they did what people say they did, um, whether that photo or that video really is them or not, all that kind of thing is pretty blurry. Um, although I even wanted his character to have a fan base who makes up stuff about him. So they're actually more of a manipulator. They're more of a hunted and that they cause more trouble for him than, than good. Um, and not because they're bad people, but because they're just enthusiastic conspiracy encrypted nuts and, you know, make too many videos online. And that's kind of fun, too. Um, so uh, I'm looking at this, this this interesting point. I said, all right, well, the first thing, this is the this is why I'm doing all this. It's taken, what, 15 minutes to tell you something that I haven't got to yet. When I look at the characters, I see something that wasn't in the statements explicitly. So I see something now across just these two characters, and there's more and more and more if you have more people, but with, even with just two characters, you've got it. You're saying, wow, this is about depth. The deep ocean waters as depth. The space, right, as depth, as the deep, that you swim the sea of space, that you traverse the space of the ocean, that you each one opens your mind, right, into vistas and insights and the past and secrets and the lost and stuff like that. I mean, this is actually starting to look, you know, pretty, pretty ooh. Um, and that, you know, when the cosmonaut blisses out, you know, in the space of the weirdness that it's the same as Hobsman and, you know, blissing out, you know, under the ocean where things are calm and the complicated emotions and difficulties of the world are far above. And the cosmonaut, of course, you know, with his crap life, um, with its, his, you know, he, he likes his students, doesn't really get anyone else. Um, you know, these two kind of fairly, if not hopeless, at least kind of go along, get along, not working out for me kind of guys who have found, you know, purpose and working together um, 
all the you know they're still kind of wondering you know what does it all mean so that's cool uh, it means i've you know i've got material to start working with my characters um as you'll see in session one uh i brought in the one of the hunteds for the cosmonaut which is uh, a character well you know given the history i talked about we have got to have you know a lost dude who's trapped in the ether and everything and i said the best thing to do is let's look at the intelligence agency i was talking about at its worst moment um, back when it was called T Contret and then something after that called EB, uh, IB. And um, in the 70s, and there's all these scandals. I mean, there's, it's, just, it's just like the CIA at the same time in the early 70s, just full on meltdown and exposure and embarrassment. And so at this phase, I'm going to say this is one of the guys who was like, a, you know, like, they ripped off the cosmonaut technology and. It all went wrong. He's trapped out there, and he's crazy as a shithouse rat. And and I'm saying he's hardcore right wing, you know, Swedish anti communist, you know, hardcore. This is like the height of CIA and EB collusion, right? He's totally into this, and um, that that's this character. Um, I also came up with someone that sort of clicked for me. Um, in terms of all this lost stuff. And I was trying to get global. I wanted to get out of the Nordic lands and get characters from all over. And that led me to come up with a pretty elaborate scenario to kick things off as to why they would be dealing with um, a, a you know, North Venezuelan indigenous character, you know, who's basically a, you know, a, a poisonous tree frog. Um, why would, you know, why would that happen in, in Yotobori? What's going on with that? Um, so you'll see in the episode, you know, that, that there's all kinds of, of, uh, you know, reasons why I could engineer that person to be there. Um, and, um, it, it proceeded from there, but that was what I was aiming at. We need, you know, kind of lost characters with a psychedelic occult shamanistic um you know highly politicized but in one step fully in the realm of slightly bullshit conspiracy as far as political history is concerned um, but as you'll see you know in my case i definitely ground it with the other foot being very firmly in what has happened so it's kind of fun for me to to be working with this concept of depth it also provides a little bit of weight because the characters are very European in terms of comics and science fiction. I tend to think of this as sort of the, the um, Metal Herlant effect. If you look at American Cosmic Zap, it's really zesty. And if you look at European Cosmic Zap, it's really grim and, you know, got kind of a, you know, it's, it's all fucked you know, kind of approach. And so you're going to see the the mating of these perspectives, you know, through the course of, of our game. So anyway, on to session one, and I hope you enjoy it.